What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with Invincible. Yes, we are. We are back with Invincible. I left you guys on an insane cliffhanger in the last video. <laughs> <laughs> so much that you guys were cursing me up and down because I left you guys in a cliffhanger. So in the last video, what we basically had was Rex, right? Robot, if you guys want to call him that. It, it's, it's interchangeable. It's all basically the same thing. This guy had launched his campaign to do what was essentially him taking over the world, or at least that's how it appeared. And that when Monster Girl had figured out what it was that he was doing, he had basically like literally had her taken away and then shot out into space where she essentially suffocated. Now, as you guys can probably guess, although maybe you didn't guess because the reality here is that Robert Kirkman in a lot of ways treats Invincible like Game of Thrones, right? Anybody can die at any time. Monster Girl is of course saved, right? She's basically rescued by one of the Viltrumites and then taken to uh, taken to the, the Viltrumite base in order to essentially be covered. Now, while that's going on, remember, Adam Eve, even though she was pregnant, was attacked by one of the robots from Rex, or at least one of his drones, and her leg was blown off. And so in the midst of all that, when she's taken to a base to, to recover and recuperate, she of course, they also end up having to deliver the baby. Now, the big concern here here for Mark right off the bat is that while Adam Eve is alive, she's currently in surgery and there's no guarantee that she can survive, right? The trauma of having a baby is already pretty high. When you compound that with the amount of blood loss she sustained from losing a leg, basically you could be looking at a situation where between shock and bleeding to death, she essentially dies. Now, of course, she does recover, which is exactly what we would expect here, right? She does end up recovering and basically, of course, Mark, you know, Mark brings the baby to her and she holds it for the very first time of course a very sentimental moment but it's one of those things where in the end uh when adam eve goes to touch mark he shies away now this is not a result of the struggles between adam eve and her relationship with mark remember mark is now a victim of sexual assault and so in those instances you ever read any interviews about anybody who's ever gone through that and they react in all kinds of different ways for example one of the things that victims will do is they'll wear their shoes to bed because they'll believe that if you know had they had their shoes on the first time that they would would have been able to run away or something along those lines. It's not to say they're wrong. It's simply their coping mechanism with how they deal with the trauma of that situation. Now, of course, again, it's one of these things where his victimizer really kind of comes around. And she had said that the first time, right? That like, you know, they'll probably like, she'll probably end up forcing herself on Mark multiple times in order, you know, in order to get herself to the point that she can conceive. It's one of those things where Kirkman's kind of like, yeah, it happened. It's there. But he also kind of glosses over it to a degree, which is particularly interesting. But what you also end up getting is one of the drones of Rex which shows up and is met by the arrival of all the Viltrumites. Now remember, right now, Nolan is the leader of the Viltrumite race. Freddie Mercury's been ousted. He hasn't been killed, but Freddie Mercury's been ousted, right? He's basically been exiled from the Viltrumite race and told to just go somewhere else. But in the moment where you end up having Rex, of course, having this conversation with Nolan, he's also, you know, attacking all the Earth superheroes and so on and so forth. And there's even a point where he meets with the president of the United States, where the implication here is that he intends to kill the president, right? But the important important thing is that as he's talking uh, with, with Nolan, he basically says, like, we should work together, right? It's one of those things where it's kind of interesting because he says, I believe you have found yourself working at cross purposes. Your main objective is to live here in peace and to produce offspring with humans in secret to pull your people from the brink of extinction. And to compound that, right, Rex goes as far as to say, and yet you want to stop me here, right? I'm sure your, your scientists have already pointed out how diminished your gene pool is with your dwindling ranks. Do you really want to risk losing more in a fight with me? And that's what's interesting because he says, were you to oppose me, I have no doubt you would succeed. You would take over this entire planet easily, but again, not without losing some of your own. So a fight is unwise for both of us and I have no desire to fight you. My ultimate goal is to create a utopian society on earth to do away with all the danger and turmoil that takes place there regularly. So to create a perfect breeding ground, I propose we work together. And that's the interesting thing here, right? Because one of the things to keep in mind, and we'll talk about this more as we get further into the story, that Robot's motivation here is not so basic as to just like plant himself as a dictator of the world. What he's shooting for is something a lot more interesting and more philosophical and something that we've routinely talked about. And so we don't necessarily see the nature of the conversation beyond that between Robot and the Viltrumites. Instead, once Mark arrives on the scene, the, the, the whole thing is, okay, like I believe we're done here. And the response of, of Nolan is, I'm afraid 
afraid so. And then when Mark arrives to basically, you know, attack the this this robot, and then also coming to the conclusion that in the end, like Rex is out there on a space station orbiting Earth, they have to destroy him if they want to destroy these robots. That the response of Nolan is no, right? We need to have a conversation. We need to talk. And so essentially, what Nolan seems to do is basically bring Mark up to speed on their on the nature of their conversation. And while we're not given the the details, the follow up conversation tells us everything we need to know, right? Like literally, Mark says, "This doesn't make any sense to me. This can't be happening. How could you do this?" And the response of Nolan is, "As emperor, I have a responsibility to my people, to our people. I have to do what's best for them." And so, in effect, what he basically says here is he struck a deal with Robot. That what Robot is looking to do here, because he wants to create a utopia, essentially, that Nolan's going along with it. Now, this is the complicated nature of Nolan's position as essentially being the leader of the Viltrumite race. That because he is the leader of the Viltrumites, and because the his people come first, in the end, he has to do what's best for them before he does what's best for Earth, right? I mean, humanity is not currently in a position to where it's facing extinction, at least not in the not in the, the Invincible world. Here in the real world, absolutely we are. But but in the, the Viltrumite world, no, right? They're not really dealing with that. That's not a major threat they have to focus on. The Viltrumite race, there are a paltry number of them. And that with various wars and skirmishes and conflicts, the writing is kind of on the wall. At some point in time in the near future, there could very well be some sort of nuclear conflict or some conflict that could turn Earth into a place where it's basically uninhabitable. And the attempts of the Viltrumites to essentially procreate and to bolster their numbers would all come to ruin. And so that's kind of the funny thing is because Mark's like, okay, fine. If you're not going to do anything about this, then I will. Right. And then Mark basically races off to confront robot and Nolan basically lets him go. Right. He essentially just lets him do his thing. Now, when he arrives on the scene, that's kind of the funny thing here, right? When he arrives here and starts to go against robot, of course, Rex basically uses their, his, his sonic pulse to kind of neutralize Mark again. That's Mark's like big weakness, right? Like sonic energy. And it's uh, it's, it's cool that Kirkman went with that because up until the point where that was introduced, there was never anything to indicate that Mark really had an actual actual weakness, right? That Mark had some kind of an Achilles heel. He was just a hybrid between a human and a Viltrumite who would just consistently get stronger after every battle he fought until such a point that he would basically be this unstoppable force, right? So it's cool to know that the Viltrumites themselves actually have a weakness that can be exploited. And so it's one of those things where literally like when a, 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 where Mark kind of tries to fight a little bit, the response of Rex is, look, man, you haven't even defeated one of me, yet alone like all these versions of me, right? Like I have built these robots in order to confront you, right? You're the most powerful of us. So these robots have to be able to overcome you. And if they can overcome you or at least stand against you, they can stand against anybody else, right? So like you're the bar, you're the standard. You can't defeat one. How could you possibly hope to defeat dozens? And so it's just like at that point, all these robots just literally start coming out of nowhere. And it's like, let's have a conversation, right? Let's talk about this. And so this is a really, really cool thing here, right? Because in this conversation that they have, Rex says like, I have to begin by pointing out the hypocrisy of you opposing me. How different is what I'm doing any different than what you and Dinosaurus attempted to do? And then Mark, of course, responds exactly how you would expect, right? We only did things to make people's lives better. We didn't try to take over the world. And the response of Rex is, and that's why you failed, right? You left too many variables in play. Your methods never had any chance of succeeding. But why won't you work with me the same way you did with him? I've killed far fewer people than Dinosaurus or your father and yet you view me differently. Is it really just because of what I did to you personally? I stranded you in another dimension. I ripped off your girlfriend's leg. Would an apology work? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of a thing, right? Trying to understand. And it's kind of funny because Rex says like, I could have killed you. I could have killed Eve, but I didn't. I'm not a different person suddenly, right? I'm not some kind of a monster. I didn't kill anybody that I didn't have to. I don't want to kill you. And he says like, I like you, right? Like I'd send you back to that dimension if the machine I constructed didn't require lingering energy from Angstrom Levy to work. Did you figure that out yet? Seems those doorways died with him. So basically the ability to travel from one dimension to the next by way of the technology that Angstrom Levy left behind is all basically gone. This is Robert Kirkman tying up loose ends, right? This is Robert Kirkman wrapping things up. I mean, that's one of the things I hope you guys have noticed with this comic so far is it's basically Robert Kirkman killing off what's left of the superhero community, right? Like all these different people who were there, reducing the number of superheroes who were out there, right? In turn, reducing or eliminating the ability to travel to different dimensions. In effect, he's closing the walls in. And so when Mark says like, stop this madness, the response of Rex is like, like what madness are you talking about? I've assumed 
control of over 100 law enforcement agencies worldwide. In the six hours since that happened, I've prevented over 9,000 deaths. I've already put systems in place that are changing the way crime is fought. He says, I've already incarcerated Titan, Slaying Mantis, Mauler, and Embrace, criminals who'd been at large for months. Stopping this madness would cost lives, not save them. So I'm asking, why aren't you willing to stay with me? Now, this is when Mark basically comes out with the kind of big guns and says, I'm, I'm basically fighting a crazy person trying to take over the world. And that's where Rex like, is that really what you think this is? Me trying to take over the world? Like, I have no desire to take over the world, Mark. And he says, I've assumed control and that control will expand as needed true but no one here knows what i've done the public at large they'll only ever see an improvement in their lives they'll see a substantive change in their quality of life and the way the world works nothing more i will not put a face on those differences there'll be no one person to receive blame or credit and he says in a way i've improved on what i did with the flaction dimension i'm fixing things from behind the curtain if you somehow fought and killed me you'd be executed for what you had done i'm the good guy here mark right if that's the simplified way you want to look at things and he says you know what this is you know the reason why you're so against it mark is because this is new it's a new way of doing things of fighting evil of saving the world and it's messy and it's imperfect but it's effective but most of all it's new do not be afraid of what's new embrace it welcome it accept it but more than anything else do not make me kill you and that's the that's the thing here right this this is the interesting thing here is that in the end what 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 we're talking about here with what rex is wanting to do this guy he's not looking to be some kind of a dictator right he's not looking to be some kind of a person who's going to rule over the world from on high and have women brought to him as he needs them and to have all the resources he needs for everything that he wants to do he's not a approaching this from like a selfish place. The conclusion that Rex came to in looking at humanity is that the freedom that humanity has experienced over the course of its existence has basically been used by humanity to effectively destroy itself, right? To create class societies, to differentiate between who deserves what based on like political, religious, or moral ideologies, to segregate people based on worldviews. But at the end of the day, of what relevance is that, right? Like if you've got a person starving and you got a person that has more than they need, then why can't that person who has more than they need give to the person who's starving the thing that stops them from doing that is their worldview right well i work to get to where i am so they should have to work to get to where they are for no this is literally for no other reason than that and looking at humanity as a whole the philosophical perspective here at least as far as robot is concerned is humanity will not improve itself unless humanity is made to improve itself now a lot of people would approach that perspective and say well you can't make humanity change it doesn't work that way but doesn't it though like usually if you're whenever you're you're talking about humanity experiencing market improvements it comes after conflict right take for example like the post-world war ii landscape the development of atomic energy and then the development of like microwaves and things like that right the ability to use technology as it existed to basically expand humanity out in ways that were never thought possible this is no different. The difference here is that it's one person making the decision as opposed to groups of people making the decision. But if everything that's happened with humanity over the course of its existence and the violence and all that kind of stuff that comes with it is the result of groups of people making decisions, then can you really make a credible argument that it should stay that way? Especially when you're talking about a person with a higher level of intelligence, a person who is by and large, regardless of how he may look, nothing more than just an algorithm and then in turn going forward from there, right? That in a lot of ways, I don't know how many of you guys ever read World War Z, but the statement of Paul Redeker is the most absolute and, and really the best way to depict this here. Imagine what the human race could achieve if it would but set aside its own humanity. And so it's one of those really, really cool elements, right? It's one of the things that I love about this. But the funny thing is that even in the face of all of this, of, of, of what he's doing, the difficulty in Rex's decision comes by way of the fact that he's got all these memories and all these experiences with these people that he's fought alongside. When he fought alongside his teammates, when they were younger, when they eventually became part of the Guardians of the Globe, or at least replaced the Guardians of the Globe, right? When the original Rex Splow died, and Rex said, in order to honor his memory, I will take his name and fight crime in his name. That way, at least some piece of him can continue on. This idea that when he was talking to Monster Girl and simply saying, like, I don't want to become the person who killed the Zaxels the way that I did, right? I don't want to become this dark and violent and horrible person. He's kind of conflicted in that way. But the reality is, seemingly, he's making the right call, that he's killed superheroes 
heroes that he once called friends. But the truth about it is that superheroes exist to maintain the status quo. Superheroes exist to look around at the world as it exists and to keep it that way. Whereas Rex's job, and at least the, the, the job he's undertaken on his own, is to look around at the world as it is and to say, the world can be better. And if humanity doesn't want to make it better, then I will make humanity make it better. And that those superheroes who exist out there, because the nature of them is to maintain the status quo, they would ultimately get in the way. And in the face of that, they had to be removed from the equation. Otherwise, progress could never happen. So it's an interesting concept, right? It's really, really cool. I mean, this is where the story ends, right? This is, you know, where he's basically mulling over all his experiences and all that kind of stuff. But it's a it's, it's a ridiculously great philosophical story. This is also one of the reasons why I wanted to postpone this for a separate video, because I felt like it deserved its own analysis absent everything else that was going on, right? Basically, it would have just taken too long if we'd added it into the other video. It would have been like a 40, 47 minute video. And I know a lot of you guys would be like, Rob, I would love to see a 47 minute video. That's cool. But that also causes problems for my channel, right? With the YouTube algorithm so you know i gotta do what's best to grow my channel <laughs> but with that being said guys we're gonna bring this to an end let me know what you guys think about this down in the comment section and then we will go forward next week with volume 21 which is really really interesting so uh thank you guys for watching and i will catch you all later peace